Four Irishmen and an Englishman walk into a bar. No, it's not the setup to a Naffold joke playing on national stereotypes, but rather, it was a meeting that very nearly paved the way for a move that would have transformed British, Irish, and potentially all of European football forever. The 1990s were a very different time for both English and Irish football. The breakaway of the Premier League from the Football League in 1992 gave English football the sense of an ancient institution that had entered into an unprecedented state of flux. There was a mixture of excitement and uncertainty, and a sense that the floodgates had been opened. No longer were clubs and chairmen bound by long-established norms. In the 1980s, media mogul Robert Maxwell's attempts to merge Oxford United and Reading to form a single club called Thames Valley Royals had been defeated, but now the yellow touch paper had been lit. There was talk of Celtic and Rangers joining the Premier League, mergers and major relocations involving existing clubs, and the idea of a European Super League, reborn over the last few years, was almost universally regarded as being the natural and eventual endpoint of these developments. Nowhere was that sense of flux and general disregard for tradition more acutely felt than at Wimbledon FC who had risen from the non-league game to be crowned as FA Cup winners, all in the space of 11 seasons, and from the fourth division to the top flight in only four, but were plagued by proposed relocations to Heathrow, Gatwick, Basingstoke, Cardiff and Dublin. Irish football, meanwhile, was in an equally unusual position. The national team was flying, ranked sixth in the world when the FIFA World Rankings were introduced in 1992, above Argentina and the Netherlands, but the League of Ireland reaped none of the rewards of that success. Floundering in a state of perpetual irrelevance, whilst Ireland reached the quarter-finals of their first ever World Cup at Italia 90, they were also the only team at that tournament who didn't have a single domestic player in their entire World Cup squad. These two worlds collided in the mid-1990s after Wimbledon left their home for 79 years of Plough Lane to enter into a temporary ground-sharing agreement with Crystal Palace at Selhurst Park. Wimbledon's chairman Sam Hammam was looking for a new home for the club, Irish property developer Owen O'Callaghan was looking for an occupant for a 40,000-seater stadium that he had been granted permission to build in the neighbourhood of Neilstown, just to the west of Dublin, and several money men were very keen on the idea. What could possibly go wrong? Well, sit back, relax, and join me on a journey to Ireland via Merton in a bizarre tale of ambition, opposition, and feckless chances, as we take a look at how the capital of Ireland very nearly came to have a team in the top flight of English football. For the best part of a century, Wimbledon were a non-league club. Founded in 1889 as Wimbledon Old Centrals, it wasn't until the late 1970s that the club first entered the Football League. In those days, there was no automatic promotion or relegation between the Football League and the non-league game, and there wasn't even a nationwide non-league top flight, now known as the National League, until 1979. Instead, the worst placed teams in the old 4th division would have to apply for re-election to the Football League, meanwhile non-league clubs could apply to become Football League members if any clubs failed in their re-election bids. Getting elected to the Football League as a non-league club was a pretty big ask, but Wimbledon were able to make a compelling case for themselves in the summer of 1977, fresh off the back of their third successive Southern Football League title when Workington, who had just finished bottom of the 4th division for the second successive season themselves, failed to get re-elected, Wimbledon took their place, setting the stage for one of the most extraordinary rises that the Football League pyramid in England has ever witnessed. Wimbledon were either promoted or relegated in every single one of their next six seasons, yo-yoing between the 3rd and 4th divisions before reaching the 2nd division for the first time in 1984. Two years later, they won promotion to the 1st division, and a year after that, Wimbledon won the FA Cup with a 1-0 win against Liverpool in the final at Wembley, which is widely regarded as being one of the biggest upsets and shocks in the entire history of the competition. 
The Wimbledon team of this era was nicknamed the Crazy Gang by virtue of the club's notorious internal culture and their often infamous behaviour on the pitch. Wimbledon players routinely pranked and played elaborate practical jokes on each other. Meanwhile on the pitch, they were loud, aggressive, and almost comically macho. In Laurie Sanchez, Vinnie Jones, and John Fashionu, amongst many others, Wimbledon had lots of physical players, and they played to their strengths. Throughout the club's rise, they rarely altered their style of play, and why would they? Gary Lineker once said that the best way to watch Wimbledon was on CFAX, but for all of their critics, of which there were many, they got results and routinely punched above their weight. Most teams hated playing Wimbledon, and Wimbledon played up to that fact. By the time the Premier League broke away from the Football League in 1992, Wimbledon had spent six successive seasons competing in English football's top flight, four of them resulting in top-half finishes, and in this new era for English football, little changed at Plough Lane. Former Irish international Joe Kinnear was the man to usher Wimbledon into this brave new world, and he did a fantastic job. In the Premier League's second season, Wimbledon finished sixth. Above the likes of Liverpool, Everton and Tottenham, three of the league's so-called Big Five, who had pioneered the division's breakaway from the Football League. Throughout all of their successes, though, there had always been murmurs of discontent at Wimbledon. Not among the club's supporters, who loved every minute of it and embraced the Crazy Gang's unique style, but among the club's higher-ups. Ron Nodes, who was the Wimbledon chairman for their election to the Football League and subsequent meteoric rise, had initially held talks with Milton Keynes Development Corporation about relocating Wimbledon to the new town 70 miles away in Buckinghamshire during the 1970s. But obviously, nothing came of that because that would be a crazy idea. After leaving to become Crystal Palace chairman, Nodes proposed merging Wimbledon and Palace in 1986, but he was unsuccessful once again. Even Joe Kinnear, whilst happy to take plaudits of the job that he was doing at Wimbledon, struggled to go more than five minutes with the press without mentioning the club's low gates and therefore low revenue, which he blamed for the club's inability to keep hold of their best players. If Kinnear could ward off interest from top clubs for Wimbledon's best players, he claimed they could challenge for the Premier League title. By virtue of their rapid rise, Wimbledon were a Premier League club with a non-league stadium. Plough Lane was once one of the best stadiums in the south of England and in the non-league game when it opened in 1912, but by the beginning of the 1990s, it was beginning to look a bit archaic in the top flight of English football. In 1959, then-Wimbledon chairman Sidney Black had bought Plough Lane from Merton Borough Council for £8,250 and gifted it to the club. The council had only allowed Black to buy the stadium, on the proviso that the site could only ever be used for football though, and if that condition was ever broken, the council would be able to buy it back for the same £8,250 fee, regardless of inflation. That was good news for Wimbledon fans, in terms of preventing the club from ever being taken over by asset strippers, but it was problematic for Wimbledon's then-owner, Sam Hammam, since it meant that the value of the club's ground could never rise above £8,250. A Lebanese businessman, Hammam moved to Wimbledon because he was a tennis fan, and he claimed that he bought Wimbledon FC on the advice of a local taxi driver, who informed him that the club was for sale. Over two years, Hammond bought over £40,000 worth of shares, taking full control of Wimbledon in 1977, the same year that they were elected to the Football League. Hammond's intention had long seemed to have been to get Wimbledon out of Plough Lane. In 1983, he paid the council £100,000 to remove the preemption clause, meaning that the council could no longer repurchase the site for just £8,250 if it was used for anything other than sports, and in 1984, he personally bought the stadium from the club for £3 million, claiming to have done so in an effort to ease financial strains on the club at the time. In 1990, the Taylor Report was published in the aftermath of the Hillsborough disaster, requiring that all major stadiums become all-seater by 1994, along with a series of other safety measures. 
Hammam claimed that it wasn't economically viable to implement the new measures at Plough Lane, a claim that was disputed by some Wimbledon fans, and that the Dons would therefore have to leave their home of almost 80 years behind. So Wimbledon moved out, entering into one of those temporary ground-sharing arrangements with Crystal Palace until a long-term solution was found, which are temporary in much the same way that everything is temporary, including the lifespan of the sun, but which actually lasts for an age. The promise from Hammam to supporters was a new 20,000-seater home close to Plough Lane in the London Borough of Merton, which had been approved by the local council in 1988. That move never happened though, and over a decade later, Plough Lane was still standing, having first been sold to Safeway who were declined planning to turn the site into a supermarket, and Wimbledon was still ground sharing with Palace at Selhurst Park. By 1994, the council approved Merton Stadium plans had already collapsed, with a strong suspicion that Hammam had never had any intention of them being realised in the first place. From that moment on, it was pretty much open season when it came to what next for Wimbledon FC. A proposed merger with Crystal Palace was perhaps the most obvious one, given that the two clubs were already sharing a ground, and Palace had just won promotion back to the Premier League. Queen's Park Rangers also presented an attractive proposition for a merger, a top-half Premier League team at the time in an affluent part of West London, and Loftus Road had just successfully been converted into an all-seater stadium in time for the 1994-95 campaign. Heathrow and Gatwick, home of the UK's two largest airports, were suggested as potential sites if relocation was favoured ahead of a merger, as was Basingstoke, some 50 miles west of Wimbledon and outside of London, but allegedly viewed favourably by Hallam due to its status as an affluent commuter town without a single professional club. There was one proposal, though, that was of particular interest to Hallam, and it was the most outlandish of them all. Wimbledon's manager, Joe Kinnear, despite not having much of an Irish accent, was born in Dublin before his family moved to London when he was eight, and he went on to win 26 caps for the Republic of Ireland. Kinnear, eternally frustrated by Wimbledon's circumstances and modest means, would become one of the earliest and most crucial advocates, and arguably the only true believer, of taking Wimbledon on the opposite journey that he had been on as a child, that is to say, relocating the club from London to Dublin. Kinnear called his old Ireland teammate, Eamon Dunphy, who was by this stage one of the most prominent football pundits and journalists in Ireland, and asked him what he thought of the idea. Dunphy was a fan, so Kinnear asked him to become the figurehead of the proposed relocation of Wimbledon to Dublin, whose future name was still to be decided, reportedly between Dublin Dons and Dublin City FC. Back in Ireland, the only reason the proposals had any legs in the first place was because of a man called Owen O'Callaghan. A controversial figure in Ireland, now sadly deceased, O'Callaghan was a property developer who had risen to notoriety as the result of a series of developments, including office blocks, shopping centres and car parks, in his hometown of Cork. I'm not saying that O'Callaghan wasn't universally beloved, but... The opening sentence of his literal obituary in the Irish Independent includes the phrase, some of questionable architectural merit, and went on to discuss accusations level against O'Callaghan of widespread bribery and corruption. O'Callaghan had been granted approval to build a stadium with at least 40,000 seats and possibly as many as 60,000 depending upon which reports from the time that you choose to believe in the neighbourhood of Neilstown, just to the west of Dublin. Earlier that year, O'Callaghan had approached Ireland's finance minister Bertie Ahern about the possibility of building a new stadium for Ireland's national football team in Neilstown. Despite flying high under Jack Charlton at the time, Ireland were still playing their home games at Lansdowne Road, which was owned by the Irish Rugby Football Union. Despite then T-Shock Albert Reynolds being a big fan of the idea, Ahern dismissed it as being a large and unnecessary expense. That O'Callaghan was planning to build a stadium in Nilstown at all was fairly controversial. 
The area was supposed to have been earmarked as the site of a new town centre, as per the 1983 county plan, meanwhile nearby Quarryville had been designated as a Greenbelt residential area. O'Callaghan, along with Tom Gilmartin though, successfully lobbied local politicians at considerable cost and with the help of TV presenter Frank Dunlop to rezone the area, allowing them to build commercial properties rather than residential in Quarryville. In 1998, Liffey Valley Shopping Centre was opened, comprising of about 100 shops or restaurants, which was still greatly scaled down from Gilmartin and O'Callaghan's initial proposals. 30 Dublin councillors were later investigated as part of the Mahan Tribunal over allegations of having taken bribes, with Shauna Dow cited as having received money directly from Dunlop and O'Callaghan, whilst others were described as being hopelessly compromised. A massive new football stadium in Neilstown, which was supposed to have become the local town centre when Quarryvale had gone from being a residential site to hosting a massive new shopping centre, was considered a cynical attempt to appease locals by some. Frank Dunlop even admitted himself to the tribunal that the Neilstown stadium idea was a ruse, his words there, designed to placate local community leaders and ensure that the Liffey Valley shopping centre plans would proceed with minimal opposition. Whether it was initially a ruse to him or not, O'Callaghan certainly came to believe by 1994 that the stadium idea was a viable one and could potentially be highly lucrative, and rejection from Ireland's finance minister wasn't about to deter him. Dunphy took his Dublin Dons or Dublin City FC proposals to O'Callaghan, who didn't take much convincing, and rapidly set about assembling a Dream Team consortium to fund the move. The consortium consisted of O'Callaghan, Paul McGuinness, Tommy Higgins, and Maurice Cassidy. McGuinness was the manager of Irish rock band U2, who were the best-selling band on the planet at the time. Often described as being the fifth member of U2, McGuinness was described as having virtually no interest in football. Tommy Higgins, however, who was the head of Ticketmaster in Ireland at the time, and Maurice Cassidy, who was the director of HMB in Ireland, were football men, according to Dunphy at least. Following a series of meetings between the consortium and her man, most of them at the Dorchester Hotel in London, a firm bid was tabled for 74% of the club's shares. McGuinness and O'Callaghan would acquire 24.6% each, the same amount would be shared between Cassidy and Higgins, so 12.3% each, whilst Hammam would retain the largest individual holding of 26%, whilst losing overall control of the club to the consortium, in exchange for £6 million. The plan was then to remain at Selhurst Park, ground sharing with Crystal Palace, until the stadium in Neilstown had been completed at which point Wimbledon would be relocated to Ireland and renamed to reflect that fact. £6 million might seem freakishly cheap for 74% of a Premier League club, given the fees that Premier League clubs change hands for these days, but at this point, the league was still in its infancy, Wimbledon were homeless, and their only real assets were their players and their Premier League status. The response... After a consortium called a press conference to announce their plans, could best be described as mixed. Wimbledon fans, unsurprisingly, were furious. Moving six miles down the road to share a stadium with Crystal Palace temporarily was one thing, but moving to an entirely different country, obviously, was something quite different. Hammam and O'Callaghan might have deemed the move to be a silver bullet, which solved all of their problems, but the minor footnote that there is about 300 miles between Dublin and Wimbledon, plus a fairly large body of water known as the Irish Sea, was not lost on Wimbledon fans. On the opening day of the 1996-97 season, as Wimbledon hosted Manchester United in a game best remembered, for David Beckham's goal from within his own half, the Irish consortium watched on from the director's box for the very first time. In the same fixture, a little over a year later, in November 1997, which Wimbledon lost 5-2 to Alex Ferguson's side, the Wimbledon fans staged their most defiant protest against the proposals, displaying banners which read Dublin equals death, 
chanting in unison, we're never going to Dublin, and refusing to leave their seats for over two hours after the game. Kinnear was remarkably flippant and dismissive about opposition from fans, describing them as, quote, idiot supporters. Meanwhile, O'Callaghan somehow managed to come across as being even more tone deaf than that. He told reporters that Wimbledon fans would be glad just to have their own stadium once the move happened, despite it being a few hundred miles away from them and the team having an entirely different name and identity, stating that Dublin, quote, isn't that far from London, and that if Wimbledon fans were willing to travel to Newcastle and Leeds to watch games, then there is no reason why they wouldn't travel to Dublin for home games. Surprisingly, that didn't make things any better. Back in Ireland, meanwhile, there was also a mixed response. Casual football fans, who weren't much interested in the League of Ireland, which is to say, most football fans in Ireland, were broadly supportive, or at least sympathetic towards the proposals. By 1994, Ireland had just reached the knockout stage of a second successive World Cup, despite the fact that they were only the first two World Cups that they had ever appeared at, and bearing in mind that England hadn't even qualified for the 1994 World Cup in the United States. The Ireland squad at that time featured the likes of Dennis Irwin, Paul McGrath, Roy Keane and Ray Houghton, but not a single one of them played their club football in Ireland. For all of the national team's success, the League of Ireland remained in the doldrums, treated with, if not contempt, then at best ambivalence for so long, by most Irish politicians, the FAI, and, in all truth, Irish football fans. The Dublin Dons, if indeed that was to be their name, was sold as being an Irish club for the Irish people. It would be Irish-owned, Irish-managed, and would prioritise signing and developing Irish players, which somewhat undermined the very silly idea that it was just a new ground and a new name for Wimbledon, but we'll park that just for a minute. The consortium claimed that a rising tide would lift all boats, and that the increased interest in a football club based in Ireland, and the experience of going to watch an Irish club, would benefit clubs in the League of Ireland, in the long term at least. In case that wasn't convincing enough though, and it wasn't, they also offered to make a solidarity payment worth between 2 to £10 million to be distributed throughout the league, and to open up schools of excellence around Ireland, which would increase the country's youth development and the calibre of player available to League of Ireland clubs if those players didn't make it at the Dublin Dons. The strategy from the consortium was basically to go directly to Irish clubs, attempt to convince them, and then hope that the FAI would be swayed by the view of their own clubs. Unfortunately, for the consortium at least, they didn't do a very good job of convincing Irish clubs, who felt as though the Dons would only take fans away from League of Ireland clubs, and potentially hammer the final nail into the League of Ireland's coffin. Meanwhile, the FAI immediately distrusted them for not having come to them with their proposal first. Eamon Dunphy was also viewed as being a very poor figurehead when it came to engendering goodwill from committed fans of the League of Ireland, given that he was renowned for his disdain for the League, which he pejoratively described as the Chicken League in his newspaper column. The chief executive of the FAI, Bernard O'Byrne, became as vociferous in his opposition to the proposals as the Wimbledon Independent Supporters Association, a supporters group created by Wimbledon fans to organise against the move, and opponents of the consortium in England and Ireland alike were in regular dialogue. So too were Hammam and the consortium, though, who felt that they had the backing of a majority of Premier League clubs and felt further buoyed by the landmark Bosman ruling in 1995. The European Court of Justice ruled in that case that professional footballers should be allowed to move freely when their contract at a club expires, just like any other employee. The consortium seemed to think, wrongly in my view, though, I don't claim to be a legal expert, that the Bosman ruling set a broader precedent within football that the sport was no different to any other business, so you couldn't stop Wimbledon from moving to Dublin, for example, and they even hired Bosman's lawyer. At the same time, however, actual negotiations had slowed down. Hammam had never agreed to the consortium's bid and kept shifting his asking price as the Premier League's early success was already becoming evident. 
1997, the consortium was shocked to discover with no prior notice that Hammam had sold the club for a reported £26 million to Norwegian businessmen Kjell Ingeroka and Bjorn Rune Gjeltsen, a far higher fee than they had ever or would ever have offered. Roka, who already owned Molde in Norway, was once the richest person in Norway, and remains the fourth richest, despite having been convicted of corruption and jailed in 2015, with an estimated net worth of $5.4 billion. Though the sale had happened behind their back, it didn't kill off plans to relocate Wimbledon to Dublin. In fact, the Norwegians paid such a hefty fee for the club, precisely because they believed the move to Dublin could pocket them a whole lot more. Hammond was an owner frequently described as colourful, like so many chairmen and owners in English football during the 70s and 80s, who would often walk around the pitch at Plough Lane and hold court with Wimbledon fans, even once they knew that he was trying to relocate the club to Dublin, and the tenor of those conversations had begun to shift. After selling Wimbledon, Hammond bought Cardiff City, where he promised to rename the club the Cardiff Celts and change their colours to green, red and white in an attempt to make Cardiff the club of the entire Welsh nation. That never happened, obviously, but he did manage to insert a clause into Spencer Price's contract that he would have to eat sheep's testicles after signing the defender for £700,000 in 2001, which, you know perhaps just gives you some insight into his thinking. Whilst Hammam's primary motivation may always have been money, he wasn't as comfortable with being disliked as others, and routinely sought reconciliation with Wimbledon fans, while still disregarding pretty much all of their concerns it should be said. Selling to the Norwegians was a masterful move by Hammam, who got out without ever having taken the hugely unpopular decision of moving the club out of London, but was able to get a fee that was only possible because of his talks to do just that, while still retaining ownership of Plough Lane, which he later sold to Safeway. The real spanner in the works for the consortium wasn't Hammam selling the club at all, but rather, it was a statement by UEFA in 1998 that they would not diverge on the matter from the view that was taken by the FAI. The Football Association in England, despite a fairly positive view on the move by most Premier League owners, adopted the same position. In order for the move to Dublin to actually happen, the consortium would need the approval of all three, of UEFA, the FA and the FAI, and with the FAI steadfast in their opposition, they had none of them on side. The consortium was confident that, if they took the matter to the courts, just like Bosman, then eventually they would be successful, but they didn't want to get caught up in an expensive ongoing legal battle. The final nail in the coffin actually came in 2000, when Wimbledon were relegated from the Premier League. Whilst the consortium was confident that they could get 40,000 people to come and watch the Dublin Dons every other week against the likes of Manchester United, Liverpool and Arsenal in the Premier League, the prospect of that many people turning out to watch the new club take on Stockport County or Grimsby Town in the First Division seemed to be significantly less convincing. By that stage, Wimbledon's Norwegian owners had already spent three years talking to a new consortium, led by Peter Winkleman, and proposing, just as Ron Nodes had back in the 1980s, to relocate Wimbledon to Milton Keynes. Winkleman had made the exact same offer to Luton, Barnet, Crystal Palace and QPR, but it was homeless Wimbledon whose owners were by this stage looking to cut their losses after the lucrative move to Dublin had collapsed, who proved to be the most amenable. In May 2002, upon appeal, an FA panel controversially voted 2-1 to one to allow Wimbledon to relocate to Milton Keynes, and Milton Keynes Dons were founded in June 2004. The independent Wimbledon supporters group, founded in 1995, who once told Sam Hammond that they would form a new non-league club based in Wimbledon and support them instead, when he asked what they'd do if he did move the club to Dublin, put that plan into action after Winkleman moved the club 60 miles north to Milton Keynes. AFC Wimbledon, founded in May 2002, are older than MK Dons, and following five promotions, they reached the Football League in 2011. 
in November 2020, the new plow lane opened, returning Wimbledon to Merton for the first time in almost 30 years. Had Wimbledon actually relocated to Dublin, it's difficult to know what might have been. The League of Ireland, but for a brief minor heyday in the mid-2000s, has continued to struggle for investment and support, even without an Irish-based Premier League team. The Republic of Ireland national team entered into a two-decade decline at the start of the millennium, and from six when the FIFA World Rankings were established, they now rank 49th, meanwhile former FAI Chief Executive John Delaney likely did far more damage to Irish football than the Dublin Dons ever could, even if the most dire predictions opposing the move had come true. With that having been said, there are some excellent Irish young players in the current team, and some reasons to be cheerful for Irish football fans, as I covered in this recent video. If Ireland had gained a Premier League team in the 1990s, it is quite possible, given the state of Irish football at the time, that they could have been highly competitive and attracted big crowds, whilst ensuring that any half-decent Irish player wouldn't have to leave Ireland before turning 20. It's also eminently plausible that, had they faltered, and certainly had they been relegated, that enthusiasm, built on sand given the manner in which the club came to exist, would have rapidly dissolved. Crowds could have dwindled, and the club's existence might have been extremely short-lived. It's also reasonable, I think, given the flux in football at that time, that if a Premier League team had have moved to Dublin, we would have seen much more serious efforts by the likes of Celtic and Rangers to join the Premier League, and at that point, if the Premier League had teams from England, Scotland, Ireland, and of course potentially Wales, given the fact that five Welsh clubs compete in the English League system, including both Cardiff and Swansea, it isn't that hard to imagine a route to a European Super League with much less opposition than we saw a couple of years ago. Scotland and Wales are obviously part of the United Kingdom, and there is some precedent for Scottish and Welsh clubs competing in the English League system. The Republic of Ireland isn't part of the United Kingdom, they fought a fairly prolonged guerrilla war to ensure that that wasn't the case, and though Ireland's history, geography, and common language might make it seem otherwise, there is no real difference between an Irish club competing in the Premier League and a French, Dutch, or Belgian club doing likewise. And it's hard to see how such a move having been sanctioned wouldn't have set a pretty dangerous precedent. Anyway, that is it for today's video. Thank you all very much, as ever, for watching. Hit the like button if you enjoyed it. I sincerely hope that was the case. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments on both a what-if perspective or just, you know, any other thoughts that you might have. And make sure that you are subscribed and have notifications turned on for both HITC7s and my backup channel in my own name, both of which should be on your screens now. You can also find me on either Twitter or on Instagram via the username at HITC7s on both, should you wish to do so.